Hi everyone, welcome to the Build a CubeSat final event. My name is Rebecca Keenan, and I'm the lead instructor for the CubeSat course. In this course, students learn about designing and prototyping small satellites, from defining the mission requirements to developing the subsystems and demonstrating an integrated hardware prototype. Each student receives a kit of hardware that represents all of the basic satellite systems. We use these kits throughout the course for hands-on projects. For example, in week one, students learn how to interface between their components and perform flat sat testing. Week two dives into the subsystems in more depth. We introduce the students to wireless communications, attitude determination, power systems, image processing, and flight software. In the final two weeks of the course, we continue to cover more satellite topics while the students tackle their very own mission. This year, we worked with scientists from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and Stony Brook University to develop a CubeSat constellation for the study of emperor penguins. The students worked in teams to demonstrate a low Earth orbit satellite that takes images of penguin colonies to track their population size and the movement over time. In their final presentations, the teams will share their analysis of their CubeSat design, its system performance in our final demo, and how they would develop their prototype into a full CubeSat flight program. Thank you for joining us today. We have six teams who are going to share with you their final project. Today, we're gonna to start with our Oceanites. Hello. I hope everyone's doing well. We're the Oceanites CubeSat. So the mission of this was to model the orbit and operation of an Earth observing satellite. And this will be simulated by the orbiter. As you can see in the left image, we built that orbiter. During the orbit, brown cardstock pieces will be placed on a poster of the Earth. The objective is to take pictures and identify each penguin colony along with an estimate of the area and the location. While doing this, there were many challenges, especially when designing the structure of the CubeSat. Things such as interference between parts and different size screws. This was solved by just trying many different orientations and just seeing what would work best. Another challenge that we had would be the placement of the battery bank as initially put on the side, however, it had to go inside. So we got rid of the solar panel to make space uh, to mount it on the underside of the top panel. However, because the Velcro wasn't strong enough and it would keep falling on our pie, we would just, we decided just to mount it on the top. So we had some difficulties with the IMU board, which is shown below right here in which we weren't able to accurately calculate roll pitch and yaw data, which is used to calculate the location and orientation. And so any values we received were inaccurate and we were unable to use the degrees to decide when an automatic image should be taken. However, we overcame these issues by doing our automatic image capture through a timer method and manually finding the location through landmarks on the images. And if we were to apply this in a real life mission, we would have to do rigorous amount of collaboration and use additional sensors to re increase redundancy. Another part that was worked on during this project would be the image processing. To do this, we would apply a color mask that sensed uh, a colors in a certain range that we would define. Uh, this would then create a mask and show only the brown spots, which you can see on the right. We did, however, have some issues with the resolution and area calculations, as it was done through uh, pixels per millimeter. However, the initial testing was done in 3280 by 2464. However, during the actual flight day, I took images in 1080 by 1920, and Melvina took images in 720 by 1280, which caused quite a few issues. This could have been solved by just testing to make sure that all of our cameras took pictures in the same resolution. And uh, we had another problem as well. As you can see here, the color mask not, uh, didn't always work perfectly because we sometimes had shadows or really bright spots from the lighting. This could have been solved also by having a bigger 
range of colors that could have been detected, or we could have used more lights to have a more uniform lighting. After we've begun the bulk of the work, integrating the systems made by the different team members was pretty difficult. Not everything worked on everyone's hardware, and a lot of our original systems, including using the sensors to measure when to take pictures and when to upload, and other fine control things that would let us automate the process, we could not get it working in time. But we were able to pull through by doing a lot of the work by hand, and it saved our project. So for our flight day results, we were able to get real-time images from one of our team members and post-flight images from two of our team members. We were also able to get the areas and sector locations of the guano and report those back to our TA, both during, during and post-flight. One of the big issues we faced as a team was getting the Bluetooth connection to work between our CubeSat and the ground station and seamlessly send photos down to the ground station. One of our team mem members was also unable to connect their ground station to Wi-Fi, which caused a lot of issues in terms of installations and getting the images to GitHub. For both of these issues, our solution was to simply upload the photos post-flight and then get the location and area data. Lastly, one of our team members' camera was not working, so they were unable to get any kind of images or data during the 10 orbit. And then we just have photos of the guano from different team members. So what we learned. We learned firstly that we needed more testing. A few issues we had such as Bluetooth ended up running to the last minute, which resulted in a very small amount of time to do testing to ensure everything was working properly. Doing more testing would have helped us resolve some issues that came up during our orbit. Another thing we learned from both success and failure was how important it is to communicate properly. There were certain common issues we were facing that we were able to resolve more efficiently because we worked together to find a solution. There were also certain times we failed at doing this, which resulted in issues that could have possibly been resolved. Finally, we learned the importance of prioritizing and not spending too much time on details, but rather ensuring basic aspects are functioning. While trying to write our automatic image capture script, we were having many issues in figuring out how to use IMU data to give us the CubeSat orientation. And it was losing us a lot of time that we could have been using to resolve other issues. So we decided to use a simpler method to do um, automatic image capture and then focus on finding the orientation later. So thank you so much for listening. If anyone has any questions, we would love to take them. Thank you so much, Oceanites. Um, I'll start you off with one question. You talked about the importance of prioritization, which is obviously very, very important for any engineering project. How would you reprioritize if you're going to do this again and work towards a flight mission? I can talk about that a bit. If we were to reprioritize, we would probably have done the Bluetooth and automatic image capturing with just the timer instead first, as those were our two greatest problems and probably the most important parts of the mission. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Abby, do you have an additional question for the Oceanates? Um, along the similar lines, what is the most thing that you are proud of? You guys had a lot of challenges you faced, but I still wanna hear what is the thing that you're most proud of? Um, I think the thing that we were most proud of is that despite all the challenges, in the end, we were still able to pull through and receive all the images from most of the rounds, which I don't think we were expecting, but in the end, it turned out pretty good. Awesome. Great job, Oceanites. Thank you for all your hard work this summer. Uh, next up, we have Julius Freezer. So uh, good morning, everyone. This is the Julius Freezer final project review. And here we have Nishida, Tarnov, Raymond, and me, Joseph, here today to talk to you about what our final project was and especially the specifics within each subsystem and et cetera. 
So to start us off, the first group definitely did talk about what the mission is, but I'll just give a more detailed emphasis as in what's the applications and how um, effective our and impactful our uh, project can be. So um, as of now, we have a lot of penguin colonies, as you can see, as to the lower left image. And the thing about emperor penguins is that uh, their populations are decreasing with climate change as climate change is melting down a lot of the glaciers and large pieces of ice that they can settle on. However, as you can see by 2100, about 80% of their colonies will be extinct. And that is a huge loss to not only uh, the species on the earth, but also as a key indicator of climate change to humanity. So the way that we simulated uh, a solution to this problem was to take pictures of penguin co colonies guano, which is basically their penguin droppings and use these images through an image processing uh, program to estimate the penguin population from the area within each colony. Yeah, and so now how did we do? Um, basically there were four rounds where we had to kind of simulate the things that Joseph mentioned previously. Um, of those four rounds, in the first and second round, uh, everything worked perfectly. You know, we were able to take pictures of the guano and from that estimate the populations um, and that all worked well. However, in the third and fourth round, um, we weren't able to take any images or send them to be processed. While there were some mishaps, we still were overall pretty successful and there were many positives on our overall flight day. Uh, one thing that worked out really well was our image processing code, which was very accurate and helped us score a lot of points when it came to figuring out the area of and finding the guano in the pictures. Overall, though, we still got pictures from two out of four rounds, and everything worked really well with those two. We were also very successful in creating a GUI application, which helped display our results and really helped show what we found throughout our mission. And our overall, our flight software and our ConOps diagram were both very successful and helped us really plot and design our our project and let us be able to accomplish our mission. Yeah, and so now just diving into some of the things that went wrong or some of the challenges we faced, um, starting with our ADCS or attitude determination and control system. And this is basically just uh, how we determine um, the orientation of the cube set. So which way it's pointing, you know, if it's tilted in any direction. And so uh, we needed to know how the CubeSat was pointed. And to do that, we used the magnetometer. Um, however, there were um, there was lots of error in those values. Um, after some testing, we found that there was plus minus 15 degrees of error in some uh, orientations. And so we could have swapped to the gyroscope, but we didn't have the time. And so we had to go with that. And so obviously that cost us some points when it came to the uh, rounds. Um, and so some of the solutions um, without give, getting too deep into the details, you can see the diagram at the bottom. Basically, there are various sources of um, error um, that a magnetometer uh, can uh, experience. We only compensated for some of them, and we could have uh, added additional calibration um, to compensate for some of the other sources of error. However, that would have been more math intensive than we were uh, able to do, and so we didn't do that. And as I mentioned previously, we could have also used the gyroscope because it would have given us more accurate readings. But again, we didn't have the time. But these are just some things to keep in mind if we do it again. So we also faced a few challenges in imaging. To start, the Pi camera module that we were using to take pictures was very fragile. Um, it was very easy to break. And a few of our group members actually did break it, including myself. Um, so there's actually a kind of a story behind that, but because of uh, my camera module breaking, I actually ended up getting a different kind of model. That's the Noir model that takes pictures in infrared. So when I try to take a picture in normal daylight, it ended up being in a pink filter. So I had to put an extra filter on top, um, which kind of messed with our image colors, as you can see in the pictures on the right. Um, the noir colors at the top and the normal colors at the bottom. This kind of messed with our guano detection software because the threshold values we were using for the normal color would not work on the noir color. 
So we had to kind of adjust that and give me a specific guano detection threshold. Um, but then we tested it like in real life and we realized that depending on the lighting, the guano detection from my own camera would either take a picture with the normal color or at the noir color. So we had to send, we ended up sending all the images that my camera took to the ground station because we couldn't figure out which threshold value to use because it differentiated based on the lighting. Um, so a couple of solutions would be be more careful when handling the Pi camera module. So powering off every time you need to focus it or do anything with the camera. And then a big thing would be making sure that everybody uses the same model because that would have eliminated a lot of our problems. And then swap to a different processing method. So HSV instead of VGR. And I added a little bit of a description on what those are. And as far as real life application goes, I think this is really important because we can't expect the lighting in an actual satellite going orbiting Earth to be the same everywhere. So HSV processing would be a lot better. It actually worked a lot better for us when we switched to HSV instead of BGR. So I think it's important to note that um, when using lighting and taking pictures that HSV is a lot better. Uh, some other challenges we had were with uh, the communications between either our two Raspberry Pis or a connection between the Pi and the internet. One of the issues we had was the, the transfer rate of data between our two Raspberry Pis, which we use Bluetooth for. Because our Raspberry Pis can only transmit Bluetooth data at a rate at about 45 to 50 kilobytes per second, um, many of our images had to be changed so they could not be full size or we would not be able to send nearly enough pictures to complete our mission. So the solution to this we had were to take smaller images so that the data, rate, the data size was much smaller and we were able to send more pictures that were relevant. Another issue we had were, was uh, having our pies connect on startup. Specifically, many times when we found that we had our programs working and we tried to run them manually, they seemed to work fine. But when we tried to run them on just so that they would work when we turned our pies on, we ran into multiple issues, either connecting with the internet or connecting with the other Pi through Bluetooth. Some of the solutions we came up with were to use compression methods to make our pictures smaller so we could send more and take better quality images. And another method that we did not try, but we can, did consider was maybe try connecting and sending data through Wi-Fi instead. So we had a few challenges with power also. Um, one of our tasks was to estimate the power draw that our Pi would use um, while running the program, but our estimation ended up being wrong. The way that we calculated our power draw was just to test the individual power draw in each of the modes that the CubeSat would enter. And then we created a mode plot, as you can see at the bottom, and that helped us estimate our final battery percentage. Um, this is kind of an important thing to note for future CubeSat missions because uh, we decided that it would be important to do more testing to do like accurate power consumption. So we should have run through our actual flight day environment a few times to kind of see which like what the actual power draw was. Um, while we overestimated the amount of power the CubeSat would use up, if someone was to underestimate the power that the CubeSat would use up in the future, it could compromise the mission. So it's really important to do more testing with power. So obviously, <clears throat> you've heard a lot of the challenges we faced, but considering the four weeks we've had and the results that all of us had four working CubeSats that either worked before flight day, on flight day, or after flight day, I would consider, and of course our team would also consider that this was a success. Um, definitely some lessons learned and applications to future projects. Uh, allocating your time and really planning out, writing out what, who's doing what, and how much time are you going to spend on each project or subsection is very, very important. And you definitely want to create fast and efficient backup plans as a compared to a main program, because if your main program doesn't run for some reason, just like on flight day, 
you can have a backup program that could run. Of course, there would be a delay, but you'd get some images saved onto your SSD card, um, SSD storage or SD card, and you could definitely uh, downlink that later in the orbit time. The creating more efficient uh, backup plans also creates a robust system that has uh, increased redundancy and also has a more protective, I would say, shield against errors. Uh, definitely, we should have done a lot more physical testing as if not even more than theoretical testing. We've made a lot of mathematical calculations and simulations, but the physical part of testing was definitely something we've lacked. And we believe that if you, in the future, if anyone was to take on this project, physical testing would definitely be something that you want to consider, or if not higher than your theoretical testing. Uh, there's also a much other conditions. So in our code, if you implemented more specific conditions, we would be able to create a more optimized image capturing and processing method. For instance, the method we use was to take images at every 40 or at every 120 seconds, so three uh, images per orbit. But if we could have image optimized, uh, optimized image capturing, that would be much more efficient. Another emerging technology is using sensor fusion. So as uh, Pranav and Nishido were mentioning before, we only use the magnetometer for the calibration, but if we were able to uh, fuse the data from between our magnetometer and gyroscope, we would get much more efficient readings. Another emerging technology is image fusion. So if you're specific to one place in the orbit that you want to take a lot of pictures for, and if you kind of just do like a, a screenshot at like a very, very quick speed, you're able to take multiple pictures and through image processing, you can fuse them into like a panorama that can uh, give you more, much more detail and higher success in your image captures. And definitely more funding would always be nice for better and more efficient materials. Um, and with that, we'll end it here. Uh, and thank you guys so much for listening and we'd be so happy to answer any of the questions that you may have. Thank you, Julius Freezer. Um, I'll start off with a, a question that we have from one of our 2020 alumni. Uh, his question is, how did you divide the roles and responsibilities within your team? Um, so I can answer that. We basically looked at what each person was good at and what they were able to do. And then based on that, we assigned each person to do a different part of it. So for example, um, working on the documentation side, the power budgets, that kind of stuff, or maybe designing the CubeSat or um, doing the testing, writing the code. We just split that all up based on what different people could do and what they were good at. Uh, I could definitely add on as well. Uh, initially, we had a different plan, but then overall throughout time, uh, we figured some people were better at different things. And um, definitely if, more, if we had more team communication, it would have been more efficient. But I mean, we still got the project done, so there's nothing to complain about that. Okay, I'll pass it off to our TA, Sam, for your next question. So what do you guys think you've learned from this course that you can maybe apply to a potential like career or education in engineering and technology? Um, I can answer that one. Um, so we learned a lot about programming, which a few of us had experience with before, but I know Joseph and I personally did not know a lot about programming before this. So I feel like in any engineering career, it's very important to learn how to program. So that was definitely one thing. And also just the design process overall, how to deal with failures and kind of like step back and find a solution to a problem. That was also something all of us learned. So, yeah. Uh, I can also kind of fill up on this. Um, I think that uh, one of the things I really learned a lot about was how to like interact with hardware as well, like having software interact with some hardware and not really just having software run by itself. Um, I think it was really important to realize that there's a lot more to making something work than just software. Thank you, Julius Freezer. And I'd also like to remind our audience watching on the webinar um, to please ask questions on the chat box on the side. Uh, we're very thankful for those of you who've already participated in the chat. We love to hear from you. Right, next up, we have Space Y. 
Hello, we're Team Spacewide, made up of Joey, Amelia, Aunt, and Julian um, from the Build a CubeSat course. And we're going to be talking about our final product review today. So first we're gonna go over our mission and CubeSat overview and then talk about analysis of some of our hurdles and challenges and how we solve those problems. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit about how flight day went and our results and then lessons to apply for future missions and for us to take as future engineers. So a science objective is to photograph images of penguin guanos in our article to estimate penguin colonies and of their size and location. And so here we have an image of the orbiter and as you can see, we have images of the uh, Antarctica terrain to stimulate like the uh, look of it since we can't really be in Antarctica physically. And here's the orbiter made of cardboard, as you can see, and the cube set to the left. And then we have a can of soup as a counterweight. And then the cutout on the bottom is basically guanos. I think you missed this slide. Oh, and this is an analysis of our hurdles. Um, so one of the issues was the image processing as to as we all have like different lighting conditions. So we have to do individual calibration of the BGR values based on own conditions. And then from the detected um guanos pixels, it was also really hard mm -hmm. to get a good conversion factors as it sometimes missed out some of them or like it wasn't really consistent. So we used an alternative method to get area of one, which was to basically have a sh shape detection to be like, oh, this is a triangle. And then this is how much area will be since we are basically using the same area for each like um, shapes. And another issue that we had while we were programming was getting accurate readings from our ADCS or attitude determination and control system. So this is what would uh, help us um, make sure that our CubeSat is in the right position to take photos. And this is where we're getting all our angles from. And that little blue chip in the bottom image, <clears throat> excuse me, is our IMU, uh, which is the device that helps us detect all this with an accelerometer, magnetometer, and a gyroscope. And so originally we were measuring our angles with just an accelerometer and a magnetometer. And those angle measurements ended up being very erratic and um, they would fluctuate within like 10 degrees of the actual angle um, very quickly, like many times per second. And so it ended up being too unreliable for us to use. So we switched to using just the gyroscope and that ended up giving us a much more accurate angle. Um, so that was how we solved that issue. And then another issue that we had was uh, getting readings from the IMU while we're imaging and downlinking our photos. So while we were taking our photos and downlinking them, it, uh, it required our code to, um, I guess, uh, slow down and um, leave the angle detection to the side while it downlinks the photos. So we solved that issue with multi-threading where we take our um, gyroscope and it, we separate it into what's called another thread. And that thread will calculate the angle throughout the entire course of the program, uh, uh, throughout the entire course of the code um, while the rest of the stuff is happening. So it'll be constantly updating the value of the angle um, uh, while the rest of the program is running and taking photos and downlinking. And then um, we also had issues with uh, transferring data. And so the way we solved this was um, we, uh, basically our issue with uh, downlinking images was we needed to get essential photos from our orbit downlink to the ground station all within a minute and our camera takes photos in 4k so this was a huge issue uh, starting off um, uh, and so the um, main solution that we used was uh, compressing the photos as many other groups did um, and just resizing them to a smaller size so that uh, they don't send all the data through uh, and we resized them to the point where they were still legible um, so we needed to find the correct balance of like the number of photos to take per orbit and send per orbit. Um, and also between like the uh, actual um, size of the image, I guess. So we ended up taking um, six uh, images per orbit and downlinking those at around um, 480p resolution. 
And then we also had difficulties with uh, GitHub, which we'll detail more later. But um, basically, well, sometimes GitHub wouldn't push or uh, pull and it would break the flow of the program. Um, and it wouldn't take uh, like, so in order to upload our photos to the cloud and uh, for our ground station team to see, we needed to push them through GitHub. And uh, GitHub was causing issues sometimes as uh, some files um, would be not photos that were being uploaded. And so GitHub would be like, oh, wait, you're not supposed to upload these just yet. And then uh, give us errors like that. So uh, basically we had a multitude of errors with GitHub that we can detail more later, but yeah. Um, flight day didn't go 100% according to plan, but we were able to have some success. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, on the first orbit of our first round, our code was able to successfully take images and downlink them. Um, and they were received successfully, but uh, when attempting to push to GitHub, like Anj mentioned, there were a multitude of errors. And the one on your screen right here is the actual error we got on flight day during that round. Um, there's a lot of uh, characters here, there's a lot of words here, but basically it's just saying that it received the images and when trying to push them to GitHub, there was a branch merging error and it basically just broke the whole code. Um, and we were only able to get one round of successful um, image downlinking. But <clears throat> on the next slide here, we have the two successful images that we downlinked that actually had uh, guano in them. Uh, these were downlinked during that, that orbit that we saw on the last page. But these are the only two successful um, images that we were able to take of the guanos. All of the other rounds, um, we weren't able to downlink any photos due to various errors that we'll go over shortly. Yeah, so the errors that caused um, the rest of the team members' pies to fail were mainly uh, errors with um, GitHub and downlinking. But there were also some other hidden errors that we didn't notice up until flight day like uh, telemetry errors where um, when we were trying to record the angle that the um, orbiter was at, uh, sometimes it would record the wrong angle or just uh, not uh, send the like data to the, down, uh, to the ground station. And that's part of the downlink error basically. So we did have um, issues with connecting to the ground station. And these errors were especially caused because um, we uh, sw switched from, uh, like as other groups have said so far, we had to switch from uh, running our code um, live to uh, running it on startup, like the moment we start up our pies. And so that uh, additional factor was something that we didn't really account for that much. And so that changed a lot of stuff with the downlinking. And so it ended up giving us multiple errors where file paths got messed up. And so we weren't able to create folders in the right places. And our ground station code uh, then had errors with GitHub because of that uh, starting up issue. So uh, GitHub gave us more errors on the ground station that we could see. And then another thing is that sometimes if the CubeSat had an issue, uh, had an error um, running on startup, we wouldn't be able to see it because we actually couldn't interface with the CubeSat until the round was done. So um, those were some issues that we had. And then also um, image processing did cause a little bit of issues with us in the end. We were able to um, get proper masks on some of the images that we got, uh, especially Julian's images that he showed us in the previous slide. But um, the main thing, the main issue was that we were using the BGR color space for all of our photos. And so calibrating the values proved to be a difficult task for all of us. And so um, it ended up being like, uh, it ended up being a very <clears throat> tedious process trying to get the right BGR values. And um, so HSV values would have definitely helped us in that case because of the uh, brightness. Uh, the additional factor for brightness. And so, yeah, the main issue that was causing our image processing to fail was the different levels of brightness in each person's room when we were running our code. So, yeah. Okay, so for some key lessons for future missions um, and things to take away, the main thing that we found was that like planning in a lot more time for testing is really important. Um, and uh, also testing with flight day conditions because we were testing our pies not running the code as we would be running on flight day because as Ant mentioned before, we have to run the code on startup um, and that introduced a lot more issues than we thought it would. Um, so when we were running on flight day that we ran into problems there. And then another key takeaway that we learned um, was to look for new approaches when the current plan isn't working. So this kind of is like when we switched from using the accelerometer readings to the gyroscope readings for the IMU because um, 
it really helped us like make our code work a lot better because a lot of things relied on the readings from the IMU. So um, when running into problems like in any mission, it's always important to take a step back and kind of look at other ways to do it instead of trying to push through with something that isn't quite working. And thank you for listening to our presentation and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Space Y. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience on calibration and the IMU. So I'm gonna kind of combine those for you for the sake of time. Um, how frequently did you have to calibrate your IMU? And how would you calibrate your CubeSat sensors once your CubeSat is in low Earth orbit? Wait, can you repeat that question again? I'm sorry, I didn't catch all of it. How frequently did you have to calibrate your IMU? And how would you calibrate your sensors once your CubeSat is in low Earth orbit? OK, so I can take that one. Um, so we actually didn't really calibrate our IMU. Um, what we did was uh, we just had a starting position and we made our IMU automatically set to zero, uh, no matter where it was on the, um, like uh, no matter where it was in the orbit starting off. And then all the angles were relative to that. But we did uh, come across, I mean, we did uh, fix that issue by taking a photo of our initial position on the, um, uh, on in our orbit. And so when we did that, um, our ground station members would, uh, like if the image is downlinked properly, our ground station members would have been able to see what angle on the orbit it started at. And that completely bypassed our need to calibrate our IME. You know, since the angles were all like easy angles, like zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180, like those kinds of uh, intervals, um, it would have been easy for our ground, ground station members to eyeball it and kind of see how it was doing. Great, so maybe you could use some ground imagery to calibrate on orbit as well. Uh, I'll pass off to Abby for your next question. Um, we have another question from chat. Um, there was a lot of talk about your struggles. What were a few things that you were proud of in your project? Um, I think one thing we're proud of is that we definitely learned a lot about running the Raspberry Pis and using the IMU and the camera and kind of interfacing that all together. And I think also, like, even though our flight day didn't go completely according to plan, like earlier that day, we did like each team member had a successful test run, not running on startup, but um, running the code just from our command line. So that was really exciting. And we we're all really proud of getting that to work. Yeah, definitely. Hey. I would like to add on to that real quick. Um, we did go through uh, multiple days before the test I mean, before the flight day where we were getting a lot of unexpected errors and um, just uh, I think all of us are really proud of the fact that we were able to persevere through that and at least get a working prototype during our testing uh, before the flight day even if it didn't work on flight day when we saw it in front of our eyes working it was a very cool experience so you know seeing the progress that we made in that way was uh, fulfilling to us. Thank you, Space Y. Um, next up, we have Cube Penguin. Hi, everyone. We're Group Cube Penguin. I'm Maggie. I'm Daria. I'm Alina. And I'm Mackenzie. Just to recap what pre previous groups have said, during this month, our team was given the task of building a CubeSat using materials that were sent to us from Beaverworks. Our mission objective was to autonomously take pictures of penguin colonies and, and being able to detect the colonies using an image processing code to identify the size of their guano, AKA penguin poop. When building the actual CubeSat, we went through many different design prototypes, but ended up going with one modeled in this mechanical design. One of our first assignments was to put together a flat sat, which made up the bulk of our CubeSat. So we built the rest of our CubeSat around this design. The walls were constructed around the flat sat, and we opted to mount the battery on top of the model, which would preserve the original flat sat design. So really quickly going over our software design, 
We had two Raspberry Pis, one of which we used for our flight computer and the other one for our ground computer. And on our CubeSat, we had multiple threads running. The main thread was to track the yaw value, which tells us where the CubeSat is in its orbit. And the second thread is for taking images and processing them. And the third one is for sending data, such as images and telemetry packets. And on our ground station, we have two threads running, one for receiving data and the second one for pushing that data to GitHub. To communicate between our CubeSat and ground station, we used Bluetooth communication. And we were successful in sending information such as images and telemetry packets over Bluetooth. And even though we ran into some difficulties to make sure that both the sending and receiving end were functioning properly, in the end, all team members were able to use Bluetooth to download data. For our power results, our estimated power draw on the of the flight battery was pretty accurate, with many of us calculating the end power result with only 1 to 2% error. Though we were also given a solar panel to include in our build, we inevitably decided not to include it because of the lack of sunlight indoors, which wouldn't allow for much of a benefit overall. From this subsystem, many takeaways could be drawn, but one of the big things that we learned was to take into account each bit um, that either draws or adds power into a system. For our attitude determination and control system, we were given a nine degree of freedom IMU or inertial measurement unit. And that included an accelerometer, a magnetometer and a gyroscope. So first we calibrated our magnetometer so that it would have zero degrees or the origin pointed at magnetic north. And we took yaw values calculated from accelerometer and magnetometer data to determine where we were in our orbits. And we were successful in getting these yaw calculations to be accurate. And originally we wanted to incorporate the gyroscope, which gives us angular velocity, but we didn't get that to work quite well. So we went with using the magnetometer and accelerometer only. And in the future, we could definitely improve this by using sensor fusion and combining different sensors to get more accurate data. On flight day, we had some issues with our IMU code on one of the rounds, but overall our ADCS system was successful in determining where to take pictures. After flight day, we found that our imaging code is successful in taking pictures and processing them in order to determine if guano is present. Something we observed was that lighting and shadows were influential in the accuracy of our image processing code. We also noted that the base of the orbiter was picked up by our area calculation code, so we made the choice to cover it with white paper. With our hardware, we found the Pi camera to be delicate and encountered several technical difficulties with it. However, on flight day, everyone's camera was able to take clear photographs. That brief video showed what testing looked like on flight day and how we operated our orbiters to take pictures of the, um, uh, of the penguin guanos. And so on flight day, our results were majorly successful because many pictures were successfully captured, downlinked, and pushed to GitHub. And also we were successful in sending some telemetry packets as well. Um, and this you can see on the picture on the right. In addition, we were able to use our image processing code to determine the guano area with errors of around 78 millimeters squared. Adding on to that, some of the major successes we had from our CubeSat included good image processing code for guano detection area calculation, being able to write effective telemetry packets once every orbit, accurate yaw values from our IMU code, and using Python threading in order to run multiple processes at once. So here are some examples of our results from flight day. 
On the top left, you can see a picture that our CubeSat took and on the top right, that is the image after processing and masking. And here we have our area calculation. And on the bottom, we have examples of two telemetry packets that were sent. On the left was from Orbit1. And as you can see, there are um, data on images taken, images sent, total bytes sent, the orbit number, and the yaw values. Throughout this project, we learned a lot about the engineering process and also collaboration. Uh, and one of the major takeaways that we took from this project was that there can never be too much testing. And it's important to test early on and also under accurate flight day conditions to accurately simulate uh, what kind of problems you might run into on flight day and hopefully prevent these issues. In addition, we learned about how to communicate well with your team members and how to split up such uh, a complicated, ambitious project into uh, critical functions to integrate everyone's individual work into one single final product. And additionally, documenting your work is also a great idea to prevent future mistakes and also to learn from your peers. In a future guano detecting CubeSat mission, improvements we'd like to implement include replacing Bluetooth communications with radio antennas, building a more robust structure suitable for harsh space conditions, having a better ADCS system with a way of detumbling slash changing orientation and a better imaging payload and image processing software for higher quality pictures. Thank you and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Cube Penguin. Uh, based on your um, results from this project, what do you think would be the biggest challenge in converting this project to a flight mission? Um, I can talk a little bit about that. So we had some issues um, with some of our group members in communication between our flight pie and our ground pie. So sometimes some of the pictures wouldn't send properly or there wouldn't be a, a good communication in the first place. So I think one of the biggest um, challenges that would come with doing an actual flight mission would be communicating between the actual CubeSat and ground station due to the fact that once you send a CubeSat into space, there's really no way of like retrieving it and, and um, you know, talking to it other than what you have already prepared. Great, I'm gonna pass you off to Abby for your next question. We have a question from chat, which just so happens to also be the same as my question. If you could do this project again, what would you do differently? I think we would definitely focus more on getting the critical functions to work before trying to focus on fine tuning some of the details and getting everyone and having better communication between like our subsystems and the work that each team member did to help like integrate them better. Great, thank you, Q Penguin. Uh, next up is Team Line. Hello, we are Team Line. That stands for our four team members, Lance, Ian, Michelle, and Ethan. So just a quick recap, recap of our mission overview. We needed to capture images of penguin guano on the Antarctic landscape estimate the guano area and its location, and then transmit this data to the ground station via Bluetooth. And then we uploaded this data and received on the ground station to GitHub. And to do this mission, we split up the different tasks. Lance worked on taking and analyzing pictures of the guano. He had to make sure the code didn't access camera at the same time and identify the guano under different lighting conditions. Ian worked on the ADCS, which is essentially where is my satellite, the positional and orientation. 
and he had to make sure that angle of the satellite measure it from the fixed reference and he had to send telemetry packets with the satellite's health info to the ground station. I worked on the image transfer from the satellite to the ground station. I had to make sure only sent files after the data had been written in them and sending images quickly. So we had to figure out how small did the images have to be. Ethan worked on the physical structure, making sure all the components fit in a 10 centimeter cube. And then we all together worked on how to integrate everyone's system, the components to make sure they talk to each other, but they didn't interfere with each other. So um, this is a snapshot of our progress um, at the testing phase. So um, first for the images and processing, uh, we got the camera to work. Um, we got it to work. Um, we got it to I actually identify the guano colonies. We got it to work under different lighting conditions. And we even got the imaging software to do the area calculation of the guano as well. Um, and while we were testing, we encountered this error where too many elements were trying to access the camera at the same time. So that would cause the code to stop. And we fixed this via debugging. And for the ADCS, um, we managed to make the satellite send telemetry packets, but during testing, a question came up, um, which one to use, the gyroscope or the magnetometer to determine the angle values. And each one had its um, pros and cons, um, but we, in the end, we decided to use both. And for the physical structure, we managed to fit everything into a 10 centimeter cube, um, which is one of the requirements uh, for a CubeSat. And for the integration, we got the satellite to run on startup, which is essential for the mission. But then we ran into this new error where the satellite crashes anywhere from seconds to minutes after startup. And this is obviously a very big problem. Uh, we spent about a week debugging this, but even after a week, we still could not figure out what it was, what it was caused by. And for the image transfer, uh, we did this via Bluetooth. Um, we established a connection between the ground station and the satellite. And during testing, we encountered an error where the Bluetooth was sending empty files uh, from the satellite to the ground station instead of pictures or telemetry packets. And then we fixed this via debugging. So on flight day, all of our satellites successfully ran on boot we're able to connect to the ground station and we're able to send at least one telemetry packet. You can see an example on the right. Um, we were all able to correctly estimate the power draw of our satellite. And uh, one of our satellites was able to take, process, and transmit all of the images to the ground station for the full 10 orbits. Um, but it did experience an ADCS issue where all of the positional values were significantly off. The other three satellites stopped working within 30 seconds due to the mentioned integration error. Um, we would, uh, to prevent some of these issues, we would spend a lot more time fixing errors and finding errors, and especially during the integration phase, um, so we could try and figure out what the uh, issue that we mentioned was caused by and stop that. Uh, we would also want to do unit tests and calibrations on everyone's satellite rather than just the person who wrote the code. So we know that that uh, code works on everyone's. And also when we receive data from the satellite, we want to make sure that data makes sense rather than just trusting it. So throughout our this course, we've learned a lot of lessons for future CubeSat missions and just future project work in general. Um, one of the things was that in a group project, every single member needs to contribute and 
combined to form a single end product. Um, we also learned that we should for testing, which also sort of runs into the next bullet point where that where we should expect that not everything works perfectly on the first time. So there should be time left for debugging. Um, when we are testing, we should simulate flight day conditions. Um, so for example, in our final mission, we had to take 10 orbits, but while we were testing, we didn't necessarily always take 10 orbits. Um, and then when an error arises, make sure not to ignore it. You should always find the root source of this error and try to solve it as best as possible to mitigate the effects. Um, and then communication is also very key. Um, there should always be communication between team members on what everyone is doing and tabs should sort of be kept on everyone and we should check in with each other to ensure that everyone is doing a good job. And our most important point is that in a CubeSat mission, there are no do-overs. So everything should be accounted for to run smoothly in testing. And even though there are some factors that cannot be addressed with testing, um, they should be accounted for as best as possible. So thank you for listening and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lime. Uh, let's start off with Sam for your first question. So what do you guys think you've learned about like communicating in teams and working on teams on complicated like engineering projects that include a lot of like subsystems and complicated systems like this one did? Um, you definitely want to specify exactly what your code's going to need what's, um, and what it's going to put out. Because a couple of times we encountered an error where we were giving out code, but not in the way that the next person's subsystem needed it in. Hey, uh, you talked a lot about testing, which is awesome. How would testing for a flight mission, one that a CubeSat that's going to be launched into space, vary from the way that you tested your prototype CubeSat? I think obviously you can't um, simulate all space conditions, but you can do the best you can. And for a real space mission, obviously you'd have to account for the structure like outgassing and thermal regulation. So you'd want to make sure that you have some way to test that. And also you'd want to um, do as best as you can to simulate the whole mission. You obviously can't because it'll be in space and you have no real control over that, but you can do your best to make sure you minimize any errors and risk factors. Great, thank you, Lime. Our last team for the day is Team Gamma. All right, hello, we're Team Gamma, and this is our final project. I'm Jonathan Godfrey. I'm Adar Shirasu. I'm Mason Adage. And I'm Claire Mao. So this is just the outline for presentation. First, we're gonna talk about our mission, then the process that we took to solve this mission, then what we struggled with, what we learned and then future application. To start off with our mission, I'll keep it brief since most of the groups have gone over it, but our science mission involves emperor penguins uh, as a great indicator of indicator species for climate change. This is because they rely on a Goldilocks situation where they cannot live too far from the water else they can't feed and they cannot live too close to the water else they can't breed effectively. And climate change is correct this balance. Uh, and the main issue scientists are facing right now is that there isn't enough data to track these penguin colonies uh, and building a full scale satellite in order to just, uh, like for such a niche purpose is not financially realistic. And as such CubeSats are a perfect solution for this. They're cost effective which is what we need. And the drawback of a shorter mission time doesn't really matter too much if you're able to get a ton of data. Uh, and our project uh, for this sum program is just a mock-up of this where we detect the 
guano, uh, which is penguin droppings of the colony. And uh, if you look to the left of the uh, slide, you'd see an actual image from a satellite of penguin guano. And then to the right is an emperor penguin disappointed in us. That's what we've done. So here were our mission requirements. Some of these we put on ourselves and others um, were given to us by the instructors. So the CubeSat shall autonomously locate and image penguin colonies. The CubeSat shall use Bluetooth only to communicate with the ground station. The ground station shall autonomously send CubeSat data to teammates via GitHub. The ground station shall be accessible to teammates. The ground station shall have a GUI terminal and photo display. And the ground station shall estimate guano area in millimeters squared and colony location in degrees. Over on the right, you can see a picture of our orbiter along with the simulation penguin guano scattered around the landscape. So here's our um, process. So we began with planning where we took the requirements from the previous slide and planned out how we would meet them. We then moved on to our writing phase where we split up the responsibilities of writing code and creating mass, power, and data budgets to be more efficient. Uh, this is how we spent our first week of the program. Um, our third stage was testing. We created the camera. Oh, we tested the camera's ability to detect guano, uh, the accuracy of the angle produced by the IMU, and the functions such as starting from boot. Um, our final stage was editing. Uh, the majority of our final few days were spent debugging and experimenting with code. A lot of things seemed to be going wrong, and it was frustrating, but we were able to resolve our issues. So this is our Council of Operations, or CONOPS, and it just does a general overview of what we did. So it's divided into three different phases, uh, launch, orbit, and ground operations. Uh, during launch, our satellite is powered on and our IMU is calibrated. Uh, and then it connects to our ground station, which starts our orbit phase. Um, and this is, I just touched on this a little bit earlier, but uh, we uh, decided to uh, use a program to detect guano uh, in a live camera feed. And if there was guano in it, uh, it would take a photo of it. Uh, this data was then compressed and sent to our ground station, started our ground operation phase, uh, where our photos are received and unzipped and image processing occurs. Uh, and then the final step in on this is uh, the final results are then published to GitHub. And this is an overview of our CubeSat design. Uh, it consists of a Raspberry Pi as our flight computer, a camera as our payload, as well as an IMU, a battery, a solar panel, as well as the frame to put everything inside. And so this is the ground station. Um, so here are some screenshots of the GUI, which stands for graphical user interface that we used to browse through the images that we received and also view telemetry packets downlinked from the satellite to the ground. So on the left there, you can see an example of an image that we could have received. And then on the right, there is a sample telemetry packet, which includes number of photos taken in one orbit. Uh, the time the packet was created, the number, the rotation it is on, and then CPU, RAM, and disk usage. So here are results. Um, we believe that overall our mission was a success. We met most of our requirements, and we have a system that can identify penguin guano, take the photo, downlink these photos, and upload to Git. Then our ground station team can calculate the surface area and location of the guano. We also used the GUI that you saw in the last slide, and we were able to use VNC to access each other's pies. You can see some examples of the photos that we received in successful runs along the bottom there. So we struggled, we uh, struggled with a couple things uh, while in development. Uh, one of our major ones was Bluetooth, since no one really had a lot of experience working with it, uh, especially not working with OBEX, which is what we use to actually transfer our files over Bluetooth. Uh, and this sort of coupled with our uh, with the, the second thing, which was Python debugging. So it's, none of us have a lot of experience working with Python. It meant that it usually took us a bit longer to debug issues since we didn't really have that built up like recognition of them. Uh, and then coupled that with not really knowing too much about Bluetooth, that sometimes made it difficult to diagnose those issues as well. Uh, we also had to deal with SG card corruption. Uh, sometimes the SG card would be corrupted and we wouldn't be able to boot from it anymore. Uh, which meant that we had to reflash the OS onto the SD card, 
Uh, then that meant we basically started from a brand new OS. So we had to reinstall all of our dependencies. And that made testing much more difficult because not everyone had all the dependencies required to run our flight software. Also, the orbiters are fragile, as me, Adarsh, and uh, Jonathan found out. So we, we ended up having to glue ours together. Um, and that also meant that not all of us had to work in orbiter setup uh, when we were testing, which also uh, slowed us down a little bit. And then finally, with flexibility, uh, our software architecture actually ended up changing a lot during development. Uh, and that meant some of the things that we required from our modules uh, changed over time. So that made it a bit difficult to uh, just change our plan. And then, because uh, just changing our plan meant that we had to go back and uh, usually revise our modules. And then uh, what we struggled with on flight day was, uh, well, really our major issue was that I tried to implement a new feature on flight day, which would take a picture at the start of each orbit. So we knew what our angle offset should be. Uh, and that uh, completely bricked the flight software like 40 minutes before our flights. So I, I was able to revert it back to an earlier build that did work, uh, but unfortunately it didn't make it onto everyone's pies in time for the uh, flights. And then finally, uh, we had a minor issue with communication on flight day. Um, we had a revised power draw uh, for a new version of our flight software, but not everyone knew what that new number was uh, until after the flights. So here's what we learned from our experience uh, taking this course. First thing is that uh, teamwork makes the dream work. Teamwork allows us to split up complex systems and be more efficient with our planning. It also lets everyone work on their expertise, pushing each subsystem to its limit. Uh, second thing we learned is that communication is key. The more we communicate, the easier problems are to solve and the more fun everyone is having in the team. Third thing we learned is that asking for help is essential. Uh, we were pretty good at this, uh, I'd say. Uh, we never felt weird about asking for help. And this allowed us to snip problems out of the bud and not turn problems into catastrophes. This is something we thought we did a good job in and we'll definitely employ, employ it in our future projects. So, last thing is, uh, to mention is trial and error. Although frustrating, it's essential. Testing is an important, pra uh, important and practice makes perfect. So there's no way to get around testing and practice. And so Adarsh just went over what we learned, but of course we want to learn more. So uh, the first thing that we would have liked to implement had we the time would be automating the orbit. So we all received a stepper motor in the Arduino kit sent from Raytheon, and we were considering using that to automate the orbit. Another thing would be learning more about real CubeSat missions. So we were really lucky and we got to watch Demi, which is an MIT CubeSat. We got to watch that ground pass um, and the screenshot is there on the left, the ground station. Uh, and then the third thing of course is code efficiency. And then for applications for future missions, first thing would be budgeting, which is critical for CubeSat missions. And in the future, we would be even more specific with link and data budgets. And then the camera beyond capturing photos and videos, uh, we maybe in the future could utilize infrared or different wavelength cameras. And then the IMU or inertial measurement unit, um, we would want to experiment with sensor fusion or combining multiple sensors on the satellite's ADCS instead of just using the gyroscope because the gyroscope can be a little unreliable at times. Um, and then teamwork, as we've touched on before, just the importance of communication. Uh, problem solving, the skill of developing creative solutions is just something that you know, you'll have to take with you in every field. And then finally, documentation, such as this presentation and the video that we made, which really allows us to reflect on mission success and mission failure. And if we had more time, we would have liked to have done this every step of the way. Uh, I would just like to take a second to thank our sponsors who allowed us to have such a wonderful experience this summer. This program was absolutely life-changing. It would not have been possible without them. Also, as a bit of a bonus, here are some of the logos we designed. Uh, maybe if we, uh, you know, as uh, Ian said to us uh, when we did a practice runs yesterday, maybe if we had spent a little less time on the logos, we would have had uh, a bit more time for testing, but it was fun and uh, it allowed us to do some additional team building. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear any questions. Thank you, Team Gamma. 
Uh, my question is for you. Um, you had a lot of telemetry information that you downlinked from your CubeSat, which is great. What was the most useful piece of telemetry data that you included? And what would you want to include for a flight CubeSat? Uh, I can take this one. So the really like the two most important ones were how many photos were taken and what rotation it was on. Uh, the amount of photos taken meant that we knew if we were missing any photos because sometimes uh, there's always those weird issues where a file might not make its way into the zip and it might not get sent. So that's important to know if you're missing any data. Uh, and then what rotation you're on, that uh, was really helpful in knowing uh, what data you're looking at specifically. Because since we uh, did 10 orbits and if we didn't know what orbit we were on, it would be difficult to know what our offset should be uh, and to make sure that everything was working properly. And then on a new mission, uh, probably like specific location data. So maybe not what orbit you're on, but uh, this is the latitude and longitude we're at. This is the altitude we're at. Uh, that's really important uh, because in space you have a bit more uh, variability in where your satellite is. And that can mean that the data you're getting isn't quite the data that you want to be getting. Great, I'm gonna pass it off to Abby for your second question. We have a question from Joel. Um, did you worry much about re re uh, reliability? And this can be applied for your mission that we did with the orbiters and for the act for like actual missions. Uh, I can take this. So reliability, uh, like you can really build that uh, like trust in your um in your like system based on testing and like re repetition of just. Like testing is really the only way you could build that trust uh, because if you know it works in a simulated uh, in the simulated sense, it most likely would work uh, in an actual mission. And the more you test, the more you build that trust. So. Great, thank you so much, Team Gamma, and all of the teams that have gone today. As you've heard today, the students in the CubeSat course designed and prototyped their very own CubeSat to estimate the location and size of penguin colonies by detecting guano in Antarctica. This type of analysis and low cost prototyping is frequently used in the aerospace industry to determine the feasibility of a mission before funding is provided for a full-fledged flight program. So my final question to the class is, would you recommend this mission as a flight program and why? start with Claire. I think I definitely would. Um, as we've talked about before in our presentations, um, it really has like real life implications with penguins being like an indicator species for global warming. And I thought that just like the proposal of that is really interesting. And also the way that we go about, you know, detecting guano, um, it could be really effective. So yeah. Joseph? Um, yeah, just adding off of Claire, you know, oftentimes people underestimate emperor penguins. They're like, oh, that's just a tourist attraction in Antarctica. And oh, that's just a cool thing to put on children's flashcards to help them memorize their English vocabulary. But in scientific, in the scientific realm, um, they're not only just a key indicator for, pen, uh, for climate change, but they're also a keystone species in Antarctica for krill and all these other microorganisms that other species also depend on. And what happens in an ecosystem is once you try to shift around the population of a intermediate or specifically a keystone species, the entire ecosystem will destabilize. So the entire Antarctica, uh, basically that ecosystem will destabilize. And once that happens, you're gonna be having a lot of organisms that are gonna be traveling or migrating to human um, populated areas that can bring a lot of dangers and hazards to those living areas. And definitely um, this, this project is, I, would, I wouldn't say all of our projects are 100% done, but they can definitely provide more feedback and a good starting block for future research to be uh, developed from this stage. So yeah, I would definitely recommend it. Marsh? Just uh, telling a bit more about why this mission is important. Um, we, we were lucky enough to talk with the scientist who was doing research on population modeling for emperor penguins. And they talked about how they don't really have 
enough data and uh, in order to like th yeah they just don't have enough data for, uh, about these penguin colonies so what so there really is a facet for uh like there really is a reason to do research in this topic and uh, cubesat is a rel is also relatively inexpensive uh compared to an actual satellite and uh and it's in relation to climate change and also uh, endangered species so I, overall i think this mission is extremely uh like needed and would definitely suggest it mason uh, yeah, so we were able to uh, ha listen to uh, Dr. Uh, Joan uh She works at uh, Woods Hole as a penguin researcher. Um, and she uh, is working on a study that is using uh, commercial satellite imagery to locate penguin colonies. But the main problem with using a commercial system is that you really have no control over where that satellite goes and what's on that satellite. So uh, uh, her team is using just normal uh, satellite imagery satellites, um, but but CubeSat can uh, provide a bit more of like a tailored experience. So you can have more concentrated passes on Antar uh, and on Antarctica, or you can uh, ship more uh, sensors so you can check different wavelengths, like uh, infrared to check for heat and stuff like that. Uh, and that's not something you can really do with a commercial satellite. So I think as having a like a specific satellite mission for just this purpose is better. Great. Uh, so thank you all of uh, all of you who participated in this class. Um, it's been a really great summer. Please join me in congratulating all of the students on the hard work that they've put in uh, and all of the excellent work that they've done over the last four weeks. Uh, you've all grown a lot as engineers, as teammates, and as just lifelong learners. So uh, I'm super proud of all of the students here, and I hope that in the audience you're proud of them as well. They've done an excellent job. I highly encourage everyone to watch the videos that the students have posted as well that go into more details on their CubeSats and uh, share some video of their flight day orbiting as well. Great work and thank you. And thank you to all of our instructors and TAs and guest speakers who've helped out with this course as well. We could not do it without all of them as well as the BWSI staff um, and everyone involved in making this program happen for these students. It's always a, a privilege to get to teach such talented kids every year. And it's been another fantastic summer. <laughs>